Hi, this is Father Mark Bulos with the Bible as Literature podcast. In this week's episode, Richard and I reflect on John chapter 12 and how the dialogue between Jesus and Judas illuminates an uncomfortable tension between Scripture and human systems of ethics and morality, twisting a deconstructive prophetic mechanism into a moral principle, the preaching on behalf of the poor against the rich. Judas finds himself on the wrong side of the law, in this case, the scroll of the Torah made flesh in the gospel narrative. This This week's program concludes with a special musical performance by children from the Ephesus School. You're listening to the Bible as Literature. This is Father Mark Bulos. This is Dr. Richard Benton. And you are listening to the 14th episode of the Bible as Literature podcast. We just completed Holy Week in both the Eastern and Western traditions, and our minds are still reflecting, ruminating on some of the texts we heard last week. So today we wanted to talk about John chapter 12, which is assigned in the Eastern lectionary as the reading for Palm Sunday, and reflect on the question of ethics and moral systems and ethics and morality. A lot of times when people hear hear practical, faithful exegesis of Scripture. And by faithful, I mean an exegesis that doesn't impose anything on the text, but actually tries to deal with what the text is saying. A lot of times they hear this kind of analysis of Scripture and explanation of Scripture, and they start asking the question, is this just about how we behave? And then from that question, they move on to, well, if it's just about how we behave, how is Scripture different from just a system of ethics or a philosophical morality or any of those things? So we wanted to debug that today in our conversation. Right, because in this chapter, for those those of you remember, Mary took ointment to pour it on the feet of Jesus, and Judas complains, and he says, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? That's verse 5. Now, John says he said it because he didn't actually care about the poor. He was just saying because he was greedy about the money. But Jesus's response is a little bit troubling, actually, because interestingly, Jesus actually doesn't say, oh, you're just greedy, Judas. He doesn't respond to that. What he says is, leave her alone so she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So then the question is, should Judas not have been worried about the poor? Which is troubling for anyone who's an ethical person and thinks that we should treat the poor well. Yes, and what complicates it even more is that while Judas wasn't quoting the Torah or the Nevi'im word for word, it's clear that he is trying to assume a prophetic voice in making the claim that he cares about the poor, it, you know, the way people often do in ecclesial settings. When the church wants to spend money on something, there's always someone, like we talked in a previous podcast, who themselves, they live in a, a palace in the suburbs, but they complain that the church is spending money on something. That's kind of what Judas does. He takes this prophetic voice and is trying to condemn in the name of something. But the problem is he's condemning in the name of something that sounds scriptural, but he's condemning scripture made flesh. He's in this sort of tug of war with Jesus. So, you know, what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, this is the funny thing. It seems that Judas is concerned that they could have more money for the poor if it weren't for this woman and her foolish action. Like, she foolishly just goes and wastes this oil instead of taking care of the poor. And what's funny is the heat behind Judas's words against Jesus, saying, Jesus, how could you allow this? So, even if speaking prophetically, the fact that he's speaking prophetically to Jesus already should trouble us to some extent. I think the fact that Judas takes this tone seems self-righteous. In Matthew 26, we have a very similar scene to this, but it's not Judas who complains, it's the disciples who complain. It appears right after Matthew 25, which is separating the sheep and the goats, so that on the last day, the shepherd will come and divide the sheep from the goats, depending on whether they helped the least of these. Sure. And right after that, the disciples complain when people are wasting money, when this woman wastes expensive ointment instead of taking care of the poor. And Jesus gets on their case as well, because what the disciples have done there in Matthew 26 is they've taken this parable of the sheep and the goats, and they've changed it into a badge of honor for themselves, which becomes their self-righteousness. And we can hear in this chapter also, in John chapter 12, Judas has this tone of self-righteousness. Jesus, how could you allow this to happen? Jesus, how can you allow this woman to act like this? I mean, if this is the case, how different is Judas from the scribes and Pharisees who say, how could this man eat with tax collectors and prostitutes? Well, it's this natural tension 
it's very interesting. The position that Judas takes, in a way, is a very rational position. It seems that Judas is speaking from the perspective of fairness and policy and ethical standards. And what's interesting is that Jesus just subverts it. He just undermines it completely and changes the reference point from what is right and what is ethical and what is good to what do I say and what benefits me. And he's saying this in the narrative as the anointed one who's walking according to the precepts of the Torah, God's right hand, the son of man who's lifted in glory as the son of God. He's saying it from that perspective, but in terms of how the metaphor functions in the text, it's as though the text itself is speaking. It's the word made flesh speaking. And the text is saying, I'm the reference. It's what serves me, not what makes sense in an ethical system. And so suddenly Judas is completely at a loss because he's trying to pin God down. I thought the prophet said we're supposed to help the poor. And Jesus Christ in the story, very much like a Near Eastern patriarch, or as we were joking the other day with our friends, an Iranian father, just does what he does. And he doesn't have to explain himself. You just have to catch up and figure it out. The reference point is everything. Because what Jesus is saying when he says, the poor you always have with you, but you do not always always have me, what he's saying is, you can only learn from me as long as I'm around, so learn what you can. Judas, how can you learn if you're taking a different reference point and measuring me against it? This is like the middle schooler who goes into math class and says, how is this going to help me, teacher? This isn't helpful. This isn't useful in life. In 13, you're going to explain what's useful in life? Right. How does a 13-year-old know what's useful in life? How does Judas know what the reference point is, he doesn't know. He takes a very simplistic ethical system, take care of the poor, as his reference point. I'm not saying that it's not okay to take care of the poor, but that is not the reference point. The reason why we take care of the poor is not because it's good or it's right in a philosophical way, but because the Torah says. We're commanded. We're commanded to. The Torah tells us. Scripture tells us. The gospel tells us. The gospel is the reference point. From that we glean this is what it is. It's like at the end of this section when there's this verse from Zechariah, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. This is coming from Zechariah where God is trying to change your reference point to understand what a king should be. In that chapter in Zechariah, the Lord has already destroyed all weapons of war. And then the king comes in. Right. Well, in the ancient Near East, the king was the head of your army. Watch the movie of Henry V. That's what he does. He goes out and he leads the army. This is what the king does. What if you destroy the army first and then say, go forth, king? Right. Makes no sense. Right. So the whole chapter is trying to reprogram us. And the beauty of how the gospel functions and how the prophets function is that it's always trying to reprogram us. We think we've got it down. We've got a system of ethics. And now we've got the gospel boiled down. We know what we need to do. Thank you very much, gospel. I'm going to go do my thing. And that's the poverty to which Jesus is referring. Unless you have really seen how business is done in the old world, where people sit down with a cup of tea, they speak in metaphor. No one knows what is being said, but everything is accomplished. Jesus speaks this way. He speaks like someone who does business in a marketplace in Lebanon. He speaks in metaphor. When he says, the poor you will always have with you, he's referring to Judas and the other disciples who don't know what they're talking about and who can't teach. So since you're always going to have bad teachers since I'm here, learn from me while you can. Learn from me while you can. And exactly. then at the same time, and that's the beauty and the power of metaphor, is that you can send mixed signals, you can send nuanced signals, you can send multi-layered signals. Because when he refers to the poor, he's referring to people who are not qualified to teach, but he's also referring, as the Torah does, I mean, he's quoting the Torah when he says you'll always have poor in the land. But again, the beauty of that is that he's demonstrating that he's the reference point and that he is the wealthy teacher because he understands this nuance about the practical situation that you'll not only will you always have stupid teachers, you will always have hungry people. Mm -hmm. So with all due respect, stop patronizing me with your cheap attempt at exegesis, Judas. Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. What's interesting is that the woman never said this is for your burial. But Jesus is interpreting this pouring out of oil as pointing towards his own crucifixion and burial, which is a scandal to the disciples all throughout the book of John. What Jesus is doing is he's using that action, whatever the motivation is. We don't know, actually. The Gospel of John doesn't get inside her head. Only Jesus gets inside her head and said it was for my burial. 
Judas, you don't understand, just as Peter didn't understand in the Gospel of Matthew that Jesus was going to have to die right. and be raised again. And Peter says, you know, God forbid. Here, Jesus is using this and saying, by the way, you don't understand what sort of king I'm supposed to be. You don't know that I'm supposed to die. And that's what we have the reprogramming of the king later on. And you don't know what the reference point is. She understands the reference point better because she understands scripture better. She understands that the true king is going to come and is going to die. You don't understand that, Judas. So we come back to functionality. We come back to understanding how something functions in a particular setting. Jesus, from a certain point of view, could be considered egotistical, self-referential, self-serving. Is that bad? Is that good? I don't think it matters in the text. It functions the way it should function according to the will of the text. And it is good that Jesus is more concerned about his burial and his anointing and about teaching than he is about the poor. Mm -hmm. No matter how hard an ethicist tries to say, oh, no, no, but it's not right. Well, with all due respect, doesn't matter. I'm setting my priority for my reasons. Ultimately, the end that my priority is serving trumps the means. Live with it. Deal with it. And it's Judas's ethical system that prevents him from seeing what the bigger picture is. He says, oh, it's about taking care of the poor. It's about poor, not poor, taking care of them or not. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Your ethical system prevents you from seeing that this oil is a prophetic sign about my burial. You can't see that. You're right. blinded by right. your own ethical system. And I think this is a challenge to anyone who reads because anyone who reads scripture thinks he or she knows what is good and what is bad. Anyone listening to this podcast has an idea of what it is to be good or bad. And what scripture always does, no matter what you hold, even if you say there is no good or bad, it's always going to hold your feet to the fire. And it's undermine always, you. And undermine you, exactly. It's Scripture is perpetually oscillating. It's like this mirror that always gives you a reflection you don't want. And that reflection is always your doppelganger. It's your opposing twin, and it's always working against you. It always undermines you. In other words, it's not an ethical system because its sole function is to crucify and to deconstruct and undermine the things, as Paul says, that we build up again. So we have this beautiful example here where Jesus is actually directly undermining what is, to all honest listeners of the text, a completely reasonable statement on the part of Judas. From a human point of view, it's utterly wasteful what the woman is doing, especially because she herself is you know, a broken person. It's ridiculous. Now, what's very powerful about this text is that Jesus, once he refers to the burial, right, and this, this is why it's so nice in the Eastern tradition that it's appointed on Palm Sunday at the beginning of the Passion and so forth, Jesus is very clearly setting his sight on the path to the cross in Jerusalem, which again, on the level of metaphor in the narrative, to my scriptural ears, harkens back to Isaiah. It harkens to the wisdom literature. And by extension, it harkens to Romans, which draws on these images of the feet of the one who runs to preach the gospel. How beautiful, Isaiah tells us, and Paul repeats, how beautiful are the feet of the one who runs to preach the gospel. We hear again and again throughout the Torah, but especially in Proverbs and the wisdom writings, about the importance of walking in the Psalter, right? Walking according to God's instruction, his precepts. And now Jesus' feet are giving off this fragrance. If only Judas had internalized that scripture, then he would have seen the sweet smelling feet of the one bearing the gospel and he wouldn't have tried to correct Jesus. He would have just said, look, whatever I think I know, this man is the teacher. And a wise person, as we hear in Proverbs again and again, submits and practices silence in order to receive instruction. But if you don't submit and practice silence, if you don't honor the teacher and the teaching, which the teacher embodies, if you don't submit and allow yourself to receive instruction, then poverty will not only continue in the land, poverty will increase, both in terms of the wisdom of the people and by extension, the poverty of those who are disenfranchised by the people. So the link between knowledge of the Bible and the problem of poverty, but it's not an arbitrary link. There's a real connection because knowledge of the Bible undermines your power. And the more your power is undermined as church, as individual, as community, in any way, shape or form that you approach the text, 
the more you are realigned to have the correct frame of mind to actually notice the needs of those around you. I mean, in Hosea chapter 4, my people are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Yes. That's directly quoted yes. from there. That's exactly what we see in the prophets. And Judas, if he had only knew about that verse, blessed are the feet who bring the good news, he would also know that a few chapters later come the chapters of the suffering servant, the one who's going to suffer on behalf of the people, and he would have had it. This is an indictment of someone who knows ethics yes. better than scripture. Absolutely. And so this is the critique. The person who thinks they know what is good and bad, but have not internalized scripture, it's always going to undermine This them. is the right kind of person. This is the right way to be. This is the right way you should do this. This is the right way you should act. This is the right way you should dress. This is the right way you should do this. I mean, in the Older Testament, God makes fun of the people by enumerating and elaborating to the nth degree on all of these uh, nuances about the right way to eat a cheeseburger so that he would show you you can't even eat a cheeseburger properly. Not so that you would say, I know how to eat a cheeseburger and everyone else who eats differently than me is wrong. This is the whole tension, obviously, in, in the argument of law and grace. The law was given to put you in your place and you're using it to lift yourself up to show that you know something. This is what self-righteousness is. And the funny thing is, an ethical system can't produce love. A system of right and wrong cannot produce love. In fact, we've seen in recent days in our own community in North America that the imposition of one system of right and wrong or another system of right and wrong just creates alienation and entrenchment and bitterness. So whereas your system and your ideology lifts you up and emboldens you, Scripture always disempowers and crucifies so that you're left in the position of a weak person like this poor woman so that you realize there's nothing left in life but to love the other. That is the correct frame of mind that Scripture is working towards. Right. Deconstructionism as a reading methodology, what they always say is you find the authority of the text and you work against the authority of the text. You find out what concept the text relies on you take that, you twist it, and you show that the text falls apart. Scripture does this precisely with a person's system of ethics. Absolutely. It finds the authority of the ethics, and it tears it apart. But what is always the authority of the ethics? It's the idea that I know. Correct. And as soon as you undermine that and say, guess what, you don't know, your whole ethics falls to pieces. Because it was premised on that point. And it reminds me also of the prodigal son and the crazy father, because what the father did is precisely work against any sort of ethics. You upset my entire household, put us on the brink of poverty for no good reason other than satisfying your base desires. Welcome home. <laughs> yeah. And undermining undermining everything you would expect. Right. And undermining any kind of right and wrong. Yeah. But here's the thing. Someone could build then a system of ethics. Like, oh, well, the system of ethics is then you're supposed to be nice. As long as you're being nice... Even if someone upsets you, then everything is good. But then look what happens here. Judah says, well, shouldn't we be taking care of the poor? Shouldn't we be nice to the poor and give money to the poor? No, not now, because I don't feel like it says the Lord. Yeah, exactly. And ethics is fighting against that. Ethics is saying, let's make a policy and let's hold everyone accountable to the policy. Well, Scripture is doing the same thing, but its policy is inhuman or non-human or in opposition to what makes sense humanly speaking and that's where everything collapses exactly and the only way you can know this is by knowing the totality of scripture you Correct. have to know that the feet of the one who preaches the gospel is also the suffering servant who's going to suffer on our behalf you have to know that before you begin but that's just part of one book of scripture you have to know the whole thing and this is the challenge for us is we have to wrap our mind around that entire boring scary repulsive totality. beautiful beautiful uplifting, inspiring totality of scripture. That is the big challenge is you have to know because poor people are gonna come and go, good people are gonna come and go, evil people are going to come and go. You have to keep your mind on one thing and that's scripture, but scripture is something that's bigger than one mind can keep all at the same time. So scripture is always gonna catch you because once you think you've got it figured out, it's gonna bring you another portion that's gonna contradict what you thought you knew. And the whole point is what you thought you knew it's always going to undermine it. This is why scripture cannot be taught ultimately the way you teach other subjects. It's not a classroom topic. It's 
something that you have to be apprenticed in. There has to be a power structure in the way scripture is taught. There has to be a senior, there has to be a junior, but that relationship has to be structured the same way in the old world someone who knew how to make shoes would apprentice a young person to make shoes. Because it's in that apprenticeship, which is expressed in our ecclesial tradition of the priest being a father, not one of the people, but a father to the people. In that apprenticeship, you have the opportunity or the position to oppose and to do things that are counterintuitive, but you know that serve the greater purpose of the teaching. If the ego is allowed to just form and hold on to its system of ethics, you're never going to get beyond Judas. No, you're, you're going to be stuck in parish council meetings until the Lord comes, trying to voting decide. on what the right thing to do is. So anyhow, thanks a lot, Dr. Benton. Yeah, thank you very much. So we're going to end today with some singing and chanting from the children of Ephesus School. They're going to recite Psalm 141. Lord, I have cried unto you.